Testing, 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 testing. <clears throat> Do we have audio? Do we have audio? I think we do have audio. Alrighty. Welcome everybody uh, to another stream. Today we're going to be doing another paper. We're going to be looking at simple and controllable music generation. Uh, this is coming out of Meta AI Research. I love the uh, little spades and uh, clubs, I think these are called hearts maybe but lets you know who did the seems like these people were the main contributors here and then the I don't know what the core team means so I guess they're kind of throwing these people under the bus here Itai got Tal Remes and David Kant but this is a relatively recent paper I think it came out sometime last week and it's about conditional music generation uh, there's a bunch of different uh, pieces here. So they do have a GitHub repo called AudioCraft. It gives you a bunch of information. They have a collab uh, and they also have a hugging face demo. So you can uh, go ahead and describe something, I don't know, a cheerful song with acoustic guitars. So obviously some amount of text conditioning going on, but then also it sounds like you can basically condition on an mp3 so I don't exactly know how that's gonna work but so it looks like they're conditioning on multiple different types of modalities which is kind of interesting um, PyTorch 2.0 notably right so that's actually not even that common we saw in some of the other meta AI papers that they were still using PyTorch 113 so this one using PyTorch 2 and Python 3.9 is actually notable there. It's interesting they're using the latest one. But yeah. Uh, apparently they haven't released the actual training code. This is just the inference code. Do they have an actual GPU with this? Or an actual weights? License weights. Doesn't, doesn't seem like they necessarily release the weights here. That's not good. Maybe in assets? Nope. Hmm. All right, this could potentially be bad. Maybe if they don't release the weights, that's kind of like a anti-pattern that we've been seeing in the machine learning world where they obviously they talk about open sourcing the code but they release actually here you go boom nice never mind I was gonna say they don't release the weights but it seems like they release the weights here yeah here you go six gigabytes this is the weights this is a git LFS, whenever you see that, that's git large file storage, which is basically uh, a way to store files in git. So if you've ever used GitHub to uh, track like a, a video game project, or in my case, a synthetic data project, and you have assets like textures and pictures and meshes and videos and stuff like that, usually Git LFS is a pretty good solution to that. You do have to pay for it, unfortunately, though. So you have to give GitHub more of your money. Sounds good. Alrighty, Rob. Nice to nice to see you. So let's get to it. Let's start with this abstract here. We tackle the task of conditional music generation. We introduce Music Gen, a single language model. I wonder why they didn't say large language model that operates over several streams of compressed discrete music representation, i.e. tokens. Okay, so this is kind of what we saw from the, uh, 
the hugging face space here is that you can actually seemingly you can condition on a melody which is an mp3 file so at some point you have to be able to uh, represent the music itself so I think there's gonna to be tokens here that are text tokens and then there's gonna be some kind of tokens that they maybe they train their own encoder for these but that are music tokens Unlike prior work, Music Gen is composed of a single stage transformer LM together with efficient token interleaving patterns. Single stage transformer LM, so obviously transformer based language model. You could probably guess that from a mile away. Single stage makes me think that maybe it's not very deep. I don't know exactly whether they're referring to just layers there or maybe just one step, right? Uh, cascading several models so okay I see what you're saying I see what they're saying here so a lot of sometimes what we've seen with these kind of uh, generative models is you have this kind of hierarchical or cascading approach so maybe you generate a coarse version of the audio and then you use that coarse version of the audio to make a, a finer version of the audio so you have like kind of multiple steps required for inference Right, but single stage maybe means that you just do inference once and you get the final product in one step of inference. Following this approach, we demonstrate how music gen can generate high quality samples. There's no actual definition for what high quality samples is here, so that's kind of a random subjective take. While being conditioned on textual descriptions and or melodic features, here's the confirmation that they're conditioning on text and on what they're calling now melodic features. Allowing better controls over the generated output, we conduct extensive empirical evaluation considering both automatic and human studies. Okay, I like this. They're going to be doing human studies, but they're also going to be doing benchmarks. Uh, superior to the evaluated baselines on a standard text and music benchmark. They don't name it, so maybe it's a little sketchy. Through ablation studies, we shed light over the importance of each of the components. Okay, I like ablation studies, so props to that. Music samples, code, and model are available. All right, so far so good. You know, a lot of teasers here. They don't really give you necessarily everything, but they uh, tease different things here, which, you know, it's always what you want to do. You want people to read your abstract, and then after reading your abstract, you want them to read the actual paper, right? It's kind of like a book, like the back of a book. It's like you want the back of a book to not just tell you, not to just be a summary of the book, but to, like, draw you into the book. Text to music is the task of generating musical pieces given a text description. Generating music is a challenging task as it requires modeling long range sequences. Uh, I guess, yeah, but I still feel like music is fundamentally about kind of like the complexity. Yeah, it's like the full frequency spectrum is what makes it difficult. You have a lot of different things on top of each other. Uh, that means that sampling the signal at a higher rate, i.e. the stamper, sam standard sampling rates of music recordings are 44 kilohertz versus 16 kilohertz for speech, yeah. So anytime you see like an audio uh, waveform, right, this that represents audio, right, really what this is is a bunch of samples. It's just a bunch of points. It's like basically a wave over time. So... 44, 48, 44 kilohertz versus 16 kilohertz. Hertz is basically one time per second. Kilohertz is a thousand times per second. So 16 kilohertz is 16,000 times per second, which means that for every second you have of audio, there's 16,000 points, right? And that's why usually when you look at these, they look like they're very, very high resolution here. So kind of what they're saying here is that for speech you can use a low sampling rate like 16 kilohertz but once you start going into the music world you need to have these higher sampling rates uh, music contains harmonies and melodies from different instruments which create complex structures human listeners are highly sensitive highly sensitive to disharmony yeah so you have this kind of like perfect soup of a complex uh, distribution that music sits on and then you also have the fact that humans are very very good at, at like identifying uh, points from that distribution and 
that makes for a very difficult generation task. Uh, generating music does not leave a lot of room for making melodic errors. The ability to control the generation process in a diverse set of methods, keys, instruments, genres is essential for music creators. Yeah, so controlling the generation process, there's a lot of different variables that you want to be able to toggle and move. I think, obviously, I kind of feel like text is the perfect way to do that, right? Conditioning on text allows you to... provides a natural language interface for controllability. I think there was a period where people used GANs and they like separated out individual variables like this and then they were trying to basically give you individual toggles for these variables but I feel like conditioning on text and letting people just use text and natural language is the better way to uh, create generative AI tools. Recent advancements in self-supervised audio representation learning, sequential modeling, and audio synthesis provide the conditions to develop such models to make audio modeling more tractable. Recent studies propose representing audio signals as multiple streams of discrete tokens representing the same signal. So I think we read a paper like this where, I think it was called Soundstorm, maybe? But basically they they quantized the audio signal and then had different sequences of tokens representing the coarser quantization and the, the like more refined quantization so breaking up the single signal into multiple signals and then kind of like a break separate and conquer kind of approach but the problem that you do this yeah so uh, it makes it more effective makes it more uh higher quality, but now the problem is you're just increasing the amount of compute you have to do, right? It's, you know, you have several parallel dependent streams, and it seems like from this abstract, one thing that they're kind of uh, talking about here is single stage. So it seems like they're going to be doing this in one shot. You know, they're, they're going to generate it directly, not have to generate different parts of it and then combine them at the end, or generate one part and then refine it. Uh, proposed modeling multi-streams of speech tokens in parallel following a delay approach introducing offsets between the different streams. Proposed representing musical segments using multiple sequences of direct tokens at different granularity and then model them using a hierarchy of autoregressive models. They might, this might literally be the paper that we read. This sounds very, very familiar. In parallel, Donahue et al. follows a similar approach but for the task of singing to accompaniment generation. Uh, Recently, proposed tackling this problem in two stages. First, modeling the stream of tokens only, and then applying a post network to jointly model the rest of streams in a non autoregressive manner. This is another thing that we've seen where basically uh, you encode the music into tokens, you do all the generation in tokens in kind of like this latent token space, and then you have a model that then decodes those tokens back into raw audio. Right. So similar to the idea in diffusion models of doing the actual generation in this kind of latent embedding space, which is lower dimensional and kind of more tractable, easier to deal with. And people have been doing this for audio as well. It kind of sounds like that's what they're going to do here, but we'll see. Uh, in this work, we introduced MusicGen, a simple and controllable music generation model, which is able to generate high quality music given textual description. We propose a general framework for modeling multiple parallel streams of acoustic tokens, which serve as a generalization of previous studies. Uh, we additionally introduce unsupervised melody conditioning, which allows the model to generate music that matches a given harmonic and melodic structure. Uh, superior to evaluated baselines according to subjective ratings. So that's potentially promising, but it depends on what they're comparing to, of course. We provide ablation study which shed lights. Human evaluation suggests that music gen yields high quality samples, which are better melodically aligned. We introduce a simple and efficient model to generate music at 32 kilohertz. Okay, so they didn't actually go for the full uh, 46 kilohertz or 48 kilohertz, which I think is actually the, what's the highest audio sample rate? Uh, the highest audio sample rate is 192 hertz kilohertz. 
yeah so generally in my kind of intuition is like 44 kilohertz is kind of the standard kind of high quality sample rate and then half of that 22 is kind of like the standard uh i don't really care sample rate but it seems like there's people that go up all the way to 192 kilohertz so okay they went for 32 kilohertz in this paper we showed that music gen can generate consistent music with a single stage language model through an efficient codebook interleaving strategy. So a codebook, what is a codebook? A codebook comes from a uh, VQVAE. So uh, yeah, here we go. Uh, this is the picture that I think of in my head when I think of codebooks. So in a VAE, kind of a little detour here, but a uh, VAE is a variational autoencoder, and basically the the task here is you have two networks. You have an encoder and a decoder. The They take in an input, right? So you take in this number here, this four. This is from uh, MNIST, which is a uh, basically these, these pictures of handwritten digits, and you have to classify them. Your encoder will take the data in its raw form, and it'll compress it into a low dimensional vector, right? Or embedding, whatever you want to call this, representation. And then the decoder takes this representation and blows it back up into the original data, right? And because you can compare the reconstructed input and the input, it's a natural kind of uh, self-supervised task, right? So then you can basically feed any type of information into this and you'll eventually get an encoder and a decoder that can speak to each other in this kind of low dimensional representation. So that's all nice and great, but at one point uh, people came up with this idea that, hey, what if this uh, latent vector here, rather than letting it be anything, right? Rather than letting this embedding, this little Z, this little communication language that uh, the encoder and the decoder are talking to each other with, rather than have that be continuous, why isn't it not constrained, right? So basically there's this code book, there's a book of codes, there's a specific discrete set of vectors that you can pass from the encoder to the decoder. And the reason it's called the code book is I think whenever you're doing in the military, whenever you actually have like uh, the people that are like Charlie Tango for Charlie Tango, right? Like the those words are from what I think is called a code book, which is basically like here are the different words that are going to get communicated to you, right? And here are the different words that you can communicate. So uh, that's what I think of when I think of code book in my head, right? So as soon as you see that word code book in your head, just think about discrete amount of discrete uh, tokens, discrete embeddings, discrete representations. So there's like a limited set of those. Uh, okay, so it sounds like they're maybe going to have multiple code books and then interleaving makes me think multiple code books that they're kind of like interleaving together. I don't exactly know. We present a single model to perform both the provided melody and faithful to the text conditioning information. We provide so probably some kind of weight that determines how much the text conditioning is impacting the final generation. Sometimes these are called guidance weights, but we provide extensive objective and human evaluations. Nice. Music gen consists in an autoregressive transformer-based decoder. So autoregressive, this word here, right, just means it's regressing itself, right? Autoregressive. So whenever you're doing a uh, transformer, right, transformer neural net, uh, you can choose to basically, uh, let me see if I can find a good pick of this, but you can choose to basically do the entire thing at once, right? Or you can choose to pay attention to your own output, right? And a lot of transformers are autoregressive, at least in some dimension, right? Where they're basically looking at their own output in order to create the next token, right? you're predicting the next word one token at a time and in order to predict the next word you need to basically have the word before it and the word before it you also predicted so there's this kind of usually there's this auto regressive nature to most of these transformer models where the transformer is regressing on its own output from the previous step 
and uh, decoder is uh, what we were just talking about here, right? You basically have an encoder, which goes from a high dimensional data space into a latent vector, and then you have a decoder, which goes from this latent vector into a high dimensional space. Yo, can this model do voice or has Meta put out the code yet? Uh, the code does exist. You can go here. There's a demo on music gen. I don't know if it does voice. I don't think it does voice, but there are a lot of very good voice models. I think we were literally looking at uh, this one, Soundstorm. And this one does singing voice. Yeah. So this is another paper that we uh, that we looked at a while ago, I think a couple weeks ago at this point, but this one is specifically for voice. And I think they even had like singing voice to some degree, but I don't know. I don't think you, I don't think, I haven't seen in any kind of uh, music generation tool that just like works, that does everything. I think if you're, if you want to generate music, you still kind of have to piecemeal it. You probably have to do the voice separately from the lyrics, separately from the uh, melody. So maybe this music gen will be good for the melody and then you can generate a lyrics with something like a chat GPT or any kind of LLM. And then you use the soundstorm to convert those lyrics into actual speech. And then you just basically combine the speech and the melody in uh, some kind of audio program like uh, Fruity Loops or whatever your music production tool of choice is. They stripped uh, soundstorms looks cool, but there's no code, correct? Yeah, someone was telling me that the Soundstorm is actually a ripoff. So this is a conspiracy theory, so don't take this uh, literally. But someone was telling me that the the Soundstorm paper is like, there's another paper that's basically the same thing that has code. And then, I don't know, maybe somebody else can dig up uh, that conspiracy theory. But there should be plenty of things. You should be able to just find on the internet audio generation that matches the specific requirements that you want. Uh, they strip the voice from the training data. One thing would be cool, create a model from the Library of Congress Citizen DJ Archive. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if you can train on the Library of Congress. I feel like that's probably a very, like, is there a digital Library of Congress digital uh, archive? Yeah, I mean, this is, I don't know anything about this, but the Library of Congress is the largest library in the world with more than 162 million items. You have books, sound recordings, motion pictures, photographs. I mean, if this is all public use too, right? Like that, I guess that's the whole point of the Library of Congress. So this is probably a very, very good data set if you guys are interested in high quality tokens or some kind of like pre-training task. Uh, the language model is over the quantized units from an encodec audio tokenizer. Okay, so. Okay, this right here confirms that uh, the generation is being done uh, in the tokenized uh, space. So they're not doing it in the raw waveform space. They're basically using encodec, which I think is literally what Soundstorm used, right? If we go to the paper, they use the same one, right? Encodec, yep. Yeah, so this residual vector quantization, which is actually a little lame to be honest, because I think the the encoding is actually the slowest part. So this is the Soundstorm paper, but 1.4 seconds for semantic generation. So this is going from the raw audio waveform into the tokens, which is with the encodec, right? And then 0 0.5 seconds to actually do the generation in the token space, and then 0 0.1 seconds to decode back into the raw audio space. So, okay, this is telling us that this paper is basically doing a very, very similar uh, technique. And, you know, it's great. You know, I like that they're everybody's using this, but it's kind of annoying because basically what's happening is that the encoder and the decoder are fixed. It's like some, they made these encoders and decoders, this paper here, De Fosse in 2022, and then everybody's just been doing that, using that the entire time. And why do they do that? Because 
doing anything in uh, actual audio waveform space is extremely computationally expensive, right? Just think about 44,000 data points per second, 32,000 data points per second. That's just a huge amount of data. So being able to use an encoder and turn it into this low frame rate discrete representation, right, which uses residual vector quantization, that's such a huge time saving. Uh, several parallel streams. Each stream is comprised of discrete tokens originating from different learned codebooks. Uh, prior work, so here you have confirmation of different codebooks. You have multiple codebooks here. And uh, residual vector quantization. We went over it in Soundstorm, but basically it's whenever you quantize a sound wave, residual vector quantization. It doesn't need to be a sound wave. This is a technique that's just generic for anything. Let me see if I can find a picture. I feel like I remember a good picture of this, but I don't remember where I saw this picture. Maybe this? All right, never mind. But basically, you're quantizing uh, the audio stream, and then you're quantizing the difference between your quantized audio stream and the original one. So that's called the residual. You can think of it almost like the, the difference, right? So the error almost. And then they quantize that, right? And then you take the difference between the second order and quantize that. And then basically, so it's basically like this progressive, increasingly higher resolution quantization, but most of the information is in the first quantization level. So there's these kind of quantization levels you see here, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. The the quantization level one is going to have the most signal, then quantization level two has less signal, then three has less signal, and so on. So it's kind of a way of taking a very infinite resolution kind of thing, like an audio waveform, and turning it into these kind of discrete, increasingly higher resolution things. Holy shit, you guys are going crazy today with the comments. Let me see. Uh, type in Citizen DJ. They have public domain samples. I've used Music Gen a lot, practically watching to get a deeper understanding. You're the one who wrote the Bark web UI. One of them, yeah, but my deeper AI skills are quite bad. Music Gen is surprisingly good. Okay, hello, everybody. Hello, Jonathan Fly. Um, MIDI output. Yeah, there is MIDI music generation. I feel like that's something that I saw in the uh, Magenta group, Magenta TensorFlow. I don't even know if this team is even alive yet, but like when I was at Google, they were definitely like, these were the coolest kids on the block, you know, cause they got to literally work on like music and stuff like that. But a lot of the papers that I saw out of this group were uh, generating MIDI files. So they weren't actually generating raw audio waveforms. But I think that MIDI files have kind of fallen out of practice. I haven't really seen like MIDI file generation anymore. I think like once you had in the past couple years, these LLMs and everybody wants to do kind of generative in the actual uh, waveform space now. But yeah, these guys are badass. I actually remember seeing a talk by this guy, Donahue, this guy here, he gave a talk about like some kind of like piano paper and it was pretty badass. Yeah, this guy. Um, but I don't know. TLDR is people are much people like actual generating in the actual audio space is works now because of these encoders and codecs and decoders. So people are just doing that. Like fuck the MIDI files, you know. Uh, propose several modeling strategies to handle this issue. In this work, we introduce a novel modeling framework which generalizes to various codebook interleaving patterns, and we explore several variants. Through patterns, we can leverage the internal structure of the quantized audio tokens. What? What patterns are they talking about here? But quantized audio tokens are the tokens that come out of this uh, residual vector quantization, which is uh, on what the uh, encodec tokenizer is based on. Conditional based on either text or melody. Yeah, and this is kind of the big one here is that you can condition it on text or melody. We use encodec, a convolutional autoencoder with a latent space quantized using residual vector quantization. So convolutional there, anytime you see convolutional, just think of 
this in your head, the convolution GIF. I always break up, bring up this GIF, but convolutional GIF. Right? This is fundamentally convolution. It's you're convolving something with something. And usually this is 2D convolution, but you can do 1D convolution, right? You could convolve in one dimensions with a one dimensional kernel. So you can do convolution in 4D, 5D. Convolution is not limited to just 2D. Uh, auto encoder, right? So this is the encoder part with a latent space. So the latent space is the this space in between this little the language that the uh, encoder and decoder communicate in is kind of the cooler way to think about an encoder sp or the latent space here right this is the latent space uh, quantized so this latent space is quantized right it's quantization is the process of reducing the precision of something in order to make it fit in a smaller space right you let me see if I can get a big good yeah this is what you th should think of when think of quantization right you have a pure signal here which is the blue thing and then you have the quantized signal which is this red and the reason you do this is because representing this blue signal might be impossible it might be very expensive you might not have the resolution to be able to do that so quantizing the signal turning it into basically this approximation this is kind of common in a variety of different uh, fields and papers and for different reasons but the difference between this blue and this red is called the residual and then you can also quantize that residual so residual vector quantization is this like kind of like you quantize a signal then you quantize the residual then you quantize the residual of the residual and then you quantize the residual of the residual of the residual and so on so you're almost like kind of like an infinite series you're kind of like approximating the actual true signal MIDI is like TCP, don't count it out, <laughs> all right? TCP, like the internet protocol. Uh, it's not totally clear, but music gen is kind of like the example model example for audio craft tools. They're in the, in the same repo, but not the same thing. This channel was the only real bark deep dive I found. Really love it. Now watching all your stuff. Hey, I appreciate it, Jonathan. We're reading papers together. You can think of it that way. Uh, an adversarial reconstruction loss. Given a reference audio random variable, okay. So D is the audio duration, FS is the sample rate. Okay, so the dimensionality here, so this is, you have uh, audio X, audio is in the set of all real numbers. This fancy R just means negative infinity to infinity of D times F of S. So F of S, if you have a 44 kilohertz audio, or I guess 32 kilohertz is what they're using in this books or in this uh, paper. 32 kilohertz audio, so 32,000 times one second of audio, you have 32,000 samples of which each of those individual samples can go from negative infinity to infinity. But in practice, they're not actually negative infinity to infinity. Usually, when you're dealing with audio, you're basically normalizing it. So this is just kind of excessive mathematical formalism here by saying this R. To be honest. Uh, encodec encodes it into a continuous tensor with a frame rate of FR less than less than FS. So FS is 32,000, but 32,000 is kind of an, in, you're not going to be able to deal with that much information. So you're going to use this encodec encoder, which is going to turn it into a sequence of tokens. And those tokens, there's a whole lot less of them per second. And that's uh, what they're saying here, right? FR is way less than FS. Uh, this representation is then quantized into Q1 to N, K being the number of codebooks used in RVQ. Okay, so they have a, a bunch of these different codebooks, right? Codebooks tell you all the possible values that these tokens could have. Uh, Q is the quantized X. Uh, and N is the size of the codebook. Right, so you have K possible codebooks and each codebook is of length n so codebook size think of it like the length of the dictionary like if you were to grab a dictionary off your i don't even know if people have dictionaries anymore but like if you were to literally say how many words are in this dictionary it's like twenty-four thousand words in this dictionary that's the size of the codebook right 
uh, and then k would be the number of dictionaries that you have in my shitty analogy of dictionaries <laughs> after quantization we are left with k parallel discrete token sequences right so one for each codebook each of length t equals d times fr so the uh, total length of the sequence is basically the the amount of or the second duration of audio times the new frame rate fr which is basically the result of this encodec encoder so it's going to be significantly less than 32,000 and that represents the audio sample so after this little thing here they've basically managed to convert a very high uh, resolution audio sample into a sequence of tokens which is perfect because that's what transformers want right transformers want like a kind of a manageable little sequence of tokens in rvq each quantizer encodes the quantization error left by the previous quantizer so this is the residual that i was kind of trying to describe where first you quantize the actual signal right you quantize the actual signal and then you take the difference between your quantized signal and your actual signal right which is the residual which is the difference between basically this red line and this blue line and then you quantize that so that's what uh, the residual in RVQ means quantized values for different codebooks are in general not independent and the first codebook is the most important one this is this is the most uh, I think this is the the key point here right which is what we saw in Soundstorm as well where this first quantization level is going to have the overwhelming majority of your signal and then q2 might have a little bit more but like q3 q4 q5 once you get to that uh it doesn't matter and i think they actually even did an ablation study in the soundstorm paper where they they came to that same conclusion where they were like hey we changed the number of quantization levels and it turns out that like once you get to a certain level of quantization like two or three i forget which one they did or which level but like the human can't even tell the difference anymore It was perfected in 1981 by Roland, but they use MIDI to control other gear outside of musical equipment like lights and fog machines. I attempted to get 8 kilohertz sound from Music Gem, but found it best to prompt for 8-bit versus forcing the audio as 8 kilohertz. Uh, okay, codebook interleaving patterns. Okay, so exact flattened autoregressive decomposition. What a fucking mouthful right there. <laughs> Uh, well, let's see what this means. An autoregressive model, all right, so a model that regresses on its own output, requires a discrete random sequence. So discrete here just means that, uh, I guess if you don't know what discrete versus continuous is, what's a way to describe that? Continuous is like, maybe, actually, this is perfect. This is discrete. Dis the blue thing here is discrete the red line is continuous right notice how the red line the the slope is always smooth right but in this blue line it's basically these discrete values and then you have these discontinuities that jump to the next value so discrete random sequence so a sequence that is made up of individual discrete chunks uh, u and it's 1 to n. n is the total length of the sequence. Or no, n is the size of the codebook. s is the, s the length of the sequence. We will take u0 equals 0. Okay, so I guess u at time 0 or the specific, the first element in that sequence is 0. A deterministic special token indicating the beginning of a sequence. Okay, so uh, most of these codebooks have basically special tokens. Right? They have, for example, end of sentence token, beginning of sentence token, uh, new line token, like all the like kind of, there's, there's tokens that represent the actual information, but then there's these called like, like kind of special tokens that represent things like end of sequence, start of sequence, and, and so on. We can then model the distribution. So t greater than or equal to zero. So this is what they're saying here. For t greater than or equal to zero, p t, so the probability distribution of u t minus one to u zero 
is ut conditioned on ut minus 1 to u0. So this is the autoregressive part. You see here how ut is conditioned on everything before it. So that's that's kind of the autoregressive right there. Recursively u tilde 0 equals 0 and for all t equals 0 for t greater than or equal to 0. I'm going to be honest with you guys. I don't know what this special p is. Special p math notation. Uh, see glossary of mathematical symbols where is it it's not even here <laughs> it's a p blackboard bold blackboard bold p what does p in blackboard bold stand for I have seen P used for primes and irrationals. That's I don't think that's what we're using it for. It was primes. Okay, that's probably not what we're using it for. It could mean anything. Okay, probability function. That's probably what ours is. Okay. So I don't think they're talking about the prime numbers from ut minus 1 to u0. I think this is basically just saying the probability function of this. Right, given these conditions. And here they're basically just giving you the same thing. We immediately have that u and u tilde follow the same distribution. That means that if we can fit a perfect model of p hat of p, then we can exactly model the distribution u. So why are they talking about distributions here, right? So distribution, like one way to think about for example, like a diffusion uh, or stable diffusion is that there's some distribution of images, like all images in the world, if you were to somehow take them all and plot them and like just throw them in one big bag, there's some kind of distribution that represents all of those images. And what a stable diffusion model is doing is it's basically trying to match that distribution so that if you sample randomly from the all images in the ever created in the universe and then you sample randomly from stable diffusion and you do that enough times, the distributions should match, right? So a lot of machine learning kind of tries to formalize uh, their language by using statistics and rather than saying we're trying to generate audio that looks like this audio they say we're trying to generate samples from a distribution of audio that matches the true distribution of audio so they're using the words distribution just to sound fancy but like at the end of the day all you're doing is just you're you're just trying to make things that are similar to other things you know I don't know if that made any sense. Perfected. I only recently understood here when I discrete think of packets of energy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, discrete packets of energy. Math description. The code is actually simple. Yeah, people like, like sometimes you kind of get a little unnecessary, to be honest here. But uh, I think here they're talking about code books, right? So code books, you can think of it like the dictionary. And then if you think about the dictionary in your head, you're, you, you, you're holding this book of dictionary and there's all these possible words. And then think about there's a little probability next to each word, right? 0 0.1 chance of being this word, 0 0.2 chance of being this word, 0 0.1 chance of being this word, right? So there's some probability, probability distribution over all possible tokens conditioned on all possible previous tokens as a sequence, right? And what your transformer model is doing is it's giving you a probability distribution over that code book. It's basically saying, given the previous n words, here is a book with all the possible words that could be next, and I'm and there's a probability next to every single one of those. Right? So I keep using words, but every time I use this, I say word, just in your head instead, think audio token. Right, so they're not actually doing it in word space here. They're doing it in this uh, code book of audio tokens, which are created by Encodex. So it's kind of like an alien dictionary where each word in that alien dictionary is like some kind of weird like token that represents a specific sound or a specific type of sound. Uh, as stated before, the main issue with representation Q we obtained from Encodex is that there are K code books for each time step. 
So this is the actual token. There's K code books, so you can have a couple different tokens. One solution would be to flatten out Q, thus taking S equals DFS times K, first predicting the code book for the first time step, then the second code book, then the second code book for the first time step, and so on. So uh, I keep going back to this Soundstorm paper because I feel like they have good uh, little uh, good figures here, but you can see here how you you can basically you can predict you can use Q to predict Q, but you can use Q2 to predict Q2. And so it's, at some point you have to decide, okay, are we predicting every single one of these? Are we going to predict Q1 and Q2 and Q3? And that's kind of what they're saying here. There's K of these. So you could flatten it out and then basically predict all of them. Or you could be auto-regressive on the thing itself, right? I think that's maybe what they're talking about here. We could theoretically fit an exact model of the distribution of Q. The downside is the increased complexity with part of the gain coming from the lowest sample rate being lost. Yeah, so if you have to, to predict from one code book and then use that to predict from the next code book and then use that to predict from the next code book, you're, you're going to be doing a bunch of extra computation and they're like, it's probably not worth all that extra computation like the whole point of using these code books and this uh, audio encoder is that you can abuse the fact that the sample rate of the sequence of audio tokens is way lower than the sample rate of the raw audio waveform, right? More than one possible flattening exists and not all the p hat t functions need to be estimated through a single model. Music LM uses two models, one modeling the flattened first K over two code books and a second one, the other K over two flattened code books. So this is more of a kind of hierarchical approach, right? Where you have one model that does kind of the coarse resolution and then another model that does the higher resolution, finer things. Condition on the decision of the first model. So this is, this is the issue with that, right? Is that now you have to perform inference on your first model and then your inference on the second model is conditioned on the output from the first model. So you constantly have to kind of alternate inference on first, inference on second, inference on first, inference on second, inference on first, inference on second. And that's basically cutting your speed in, in half. The number of autoregressive steps is still DFS times K. Yeah, so for every for whatever the sample rate of your uh, sequence is, times the duration, length of the sequence, times k, the number of codebooks. Inexact autoregressive decomposition. Another possibility is to consider an autoregressive decoder decomposition, where some codebooks are predicted in parallel. Okay, so maybe you don't need to feed the output of one hierarchical uh, transformer model into the next one, and you can do this in parallel. Okay, so that's what they're saying there. Maybe we can save a little bit of compute by doing these things in parallel and not conditioning them on the output of each other. Now let's define another sequence. <laughs> so like 10 different sequence definitions here. Uh, for all t, 1 to n, and k, 1 to k, so k code books, and then n uh, total tokens, so length of the sequence n, length of the code books k, v of tk equals q of tk, then dropping the code book index k, right, so in your dictionary, there's, in this alien dictionary of alien tokens that represent sounds, there's an index, so the very first one is zero, then you have one, then you have two, then you have three, and then so on all the way to k, which is the length of the code books. Uh, we mean the concatenation of all code books at time t. Okay, so concatenation is the keyword here, right? So rather than saying, hey, I have this little vector from the first code book and this little vector from the second code book, and I'm going to use the first code book sequence to predict basically the the next first code book and then I'm going to use all of that to predict the next residual 
codebook or the, the, the second quantization level in residual vector quantization for that codebook, why don't we just treat these separate quantization levels as basically one giant concatenated vector, right? So rather than treating them as separate little vectors, we just concatenate them all into one big giant vector and then we're, we just do that. So now we don't have uh, multiple hierarchical levels, we just have one token that kind of is the concatenation of all previous or all the different quantization levels. So you have this same equation that you have here, right? You have some probability distribution over all tokens conditioned on all previous tokens. And then let us again define recursively for all t greater than zero. For all t greater than zero, 4k probability distribution over these tokens v tilde tk equals the probability distribution of all overall tokens. This is kind of like needless, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't think you need these for all t, like, I don't know. I'm not liking these like necessary, like formalism that they're putting in here. We no longer have the general case that follows the same distribution as v, even assuming we have access to the exact distribution. We immediately have, okay, so they're saying that here you have the same distribution. But here you do not have the same distribution. Oh. Okay, so I think the, the key difference here is that the the different levels of quantization are dependent on each other. They're not independent, right? So here, you see how there's different levels of quantization, but because the way that the quantization is done, right, your the second level of quantization is the quantization of the residual of the first level of quantization. So the second level of quantization is very dependent on the first level of quantization, right? So I think that's the problem here. As t increases, the errors will compound and the two distributions can grow further apart. Such a decomposition is inexact, but allows to keep the original frame rate, which can be considerably sped up training and inference, especially for long sequences. Interesting, the Valley speech generator model uses an inexact autoregressive decomposition. It first predicts sequentially the first codebook for all time steps, then predicts in parallel all the remaining codebooks implicitly assuming they are independent conditionally only on the first codebook. Okay, so you basically have this kind of fundamental trade-off where you can do things separately, which you should do because they're independent, they're not independent, right? They're kind of related to each other, these different codebooks, because they're residual vector quantizations of the same original signal. But if you do that, it's gonna be very slow. So people are basically trying to do as much in parallel as they can without breaking this. I feel like I can kind of see what they're saying, but I also can't, I don't know. It seems like this just made it more confusing. They go really, really deep in comparing different strategies of code books. It's like half the paper. It would be cool to see the model end up in something like a fitness or a wellness app. Yeah. I think it's like, ultimately you have some code book, right? Like I, I keep coming back to this analogy of the alien dictionary with a bunch of tokens. And then what the model is doing, right? Is it's predicting the probability distribution over that alien dictionary. It's saying the next token here Here's the distribution over all possible tokens that it could be, right? But the problem here is that because they're doing this residual vector quantization, they have multiple alien dictionaries. But the problem is that only alien dictionary number zero, the very first one, is basically independent. All other alien dictionaries are dependent or conditional on the first one, right? Because they're based on that residual. 
So they have this problem where they want to match the distribution over those alien dictionaries, but the the fact that they're dependent on each other makes it hard to do in parallel. You basically need to like the 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 way that the the kind of like at a high level the 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 math kind of implores you to do it one after the other. Like you need the probability distribution over the first one to get the probability distribution over the second one. Oh my god. And this just gets even more complicated. Audio arbitrary codebook interleaving patterns. <laughs> In order to experiment with various such decompositions and measure exactly the impact of using an inexact decomposition, we introduce codebook. So interleaving patterns. Possibly the worst fucking name I've ever heard of. <laughs> Let us consider Omega. Okay, Omega is a set. You see these little curly brackets that tells you it's a set of things. It's a set of TK. Actually, this almost looks like the Python dictionary notation, right? Where this is the key and then this is the... Yeah, okay, but it is a set. Okay, so for a second there I was like, are they confusing math notation and Python dictionary notation? But this is not. Okay, curly brackets is a set. That's correct. For all pairs of time steps and codebook indices. Okay, so... Omega is a set of tuples, basically, where you have some time step t, right, which is how far along the sequence of tokens you are, and then k, which is which alien dictionary are you using. Um, there is a total, t is a set of 1 all the way to d times fr, so how many time steps are there? How, what is the length of the sequence? It's uh, basically d times fr, right? It's the duration of your audio times the sample rate. And, of course, because why not, these are indexed at 1 rather than 0, which is annoying because if you actually go into the code, they're probably indexed with 0 because that's just the way it works. And then you have k total alien dictionaries. Uh, a codebook pattern is a sequence p. Okay, so they're introducing a new thing here, codebook pattern, which is p goes from 0 all the way to s with p0 equals null and for all 0 less than i less than or equal to s pi is a partition of omega let's look up the formal definition of partition math uh, partition of a set, this is exactly what we want. A partition of a set is a grouping of its element into non-empty subsets such in such a way that every element is included in exactly one subset. Okay, and I think this is the key this is the key the uh, the key part here, right? Is that every word in that alien dictionary has at least one partition. So you're breaking it up into exactly so for example, here you go. Here are partitions. 52 partitions of a set with five elements. A colored region indicates a subset of X that forms a member of an enclosing partition. Uncolored dots indicate single element subsets. Okay, so if you had five dots, here are all the possible partitions of those five dots. So you could partition them into groups of three and then two groups of one. You can partition them into two groups of two and one group of one. So the partitions don't need to be the same size, but they need, every single element needs to have a partition in one participle, or I guess, in a valid partition. Okay. So now that we know what a partition is, you have a, they're calling a codebook pattern, but a P, but P is a partition, so it's really a codebook partition. We model Q by predicting the parallel, all the positions in PT, conditionally on all the positions in P0 to PT. Okay, so they're going to have some model which is going to try to predict PT conditioned on all the previous P's. Right, and notice here how it's not P0 to PT minus 1. 
it's all the way to PT. So it's conditioning on all of the partitions, all of these codebook partitions. Pragmatically, we restrict ourselves to patterns where each codebook index appears at most once in any of the PS. Yeah, so this is consistent with what we just read where each partition can only have, or each element can only appear in one partition. Someone could submit a PR to rename it for kit. The first trick, introducing a delay between codebooks, it limits their dependency at a given dime step and allows predicting them in parallel. Thanks to this, we can easily train on long sequences without needing semantic tokens or intermediate models. Is that from this paper? We can now easily define a number of decompositions, for instance, the parallel pattern given by PS Inspired a pattern can be defined ps equals s comma 1 and then ps equals s comma k. So you see here they're using the first code book. So if s is less than or equal to t, right, s is the first element here. Or no, S is the actual codebook partition, so it's the partition of the codebooks. So S is basically the partition of these alien dictionaries. So you have a bunch of different partitions, and S is like kind of the index of the partition, right? There's a bunch of these, 0 all the way to S. If S is less than or equal to T, you're using the first partition. If S is not less than or equal to T, No, S is the partition, K is the codebook. So this is the first codebook, and then this is all codebooks from 2 to K. So is this just really just a fucking in, like unnecessarily complicated way of saying that we basically use the first codebook for everything, and then uh, we basically mash together all the other codebooks? It is also possible to introduce a delay between the codebooks. S minus K plus 1, K, where K is from 1 to K, and S minus K is greater than or equal to 0. So, does this make sense? That makes sense. S starts at 1, and then K starts at 1, so if you have S equals 1 and K equals 1, that's equal to 0, so that's fine. So you can do this from the beginning. K is still from 1 to K, so this is the alien dictionaries. There's still K alien dictionaries, that's fine. And then PS, which is the sequence of partitions. Has basically a offset by 1, is what I'm reading here. So K plus 1, S minus K plus 1. So if S is 0 and K is 0, this is going to be 1. If S is 2 and K is 0, this is going to be 3. So there's this kind of weird offset with the sequence of these codebook patterns, aka partitions. Or no, a pattern is a sequence of partitions. So it's like a sequence of subsets of alien dictionaries. We show the benefits and drawbacks of various codebook patterns, shedding a light on the importance of exact modeling of the parallel codebook sequences. So what exactly is the purpose of this? Why would you want to partition an alien dictionary, right? So like, let's try to think at a high level here. I think Maybe one way to interpret this is that the codebook, aka the alien dictionary, is most of it is actually garbage. Is that really 90% of that codebook is just words that you're never going to use, and you're really only using a very small subset of those words in the Asian in the uh, alien dictionary. If that's the case, you don't want to be dealing with the full codebook. You want to be dealing with these partitions of codebooks, right? Almost like these little mini summary alien dictionaries that are like here are the like 100 words that appear the most right so 
maybe the whole reason for doing this is that you don't have to use the full code books. Yeah, and then to Jonathan's point, I think the the delay between them is so that they kind of don't have to deal with this problem, right? Where technically the code books are kind of dependent on each other because they're uh, quantizing the residual of the previous one. So by having this delay, aka the offset, they can do it in parallel. This still seems like I don't know, there's some there's some high level intuition why they're doing all this crap here, but like we're kind of seeing pieces of it, but it still feels like they're just kind of like explaining some very weird trick that they understand why they did this trick, but I don't really understand why they're doing this trick. Let's see if we can uh, perhaps find truth in continued reading. <laughs> Given a textual description matching the input audio X, we compute a conditioning tensor C. Uh, R T C times D. D is the inner dimension used in the autoregressive model. So this is the uh, dimensionality of the text conditioning vector, right? So here, whenever they're conditioning on this text, they're tokenizing this and turning this into a vector, and then that vector is being used to condition the language model that then generates the tokens for the actual encodec uh, decoder and encoder. There are three main approaches for representing text for conditional audio generation. Uh, using a pre-trained text encoder, specifically T5, that's another Google one there. Uh, show that using instruct-based language models provides superior performance. Claim that a joint text audio representation such as CLAP, <laughs> that's kind of cool. So you've heard of CLIP, right? CLIP is a joint image text representation, and apparently CLAP is a joint text audio representation. We've actually seen uh, this before. I think they're uh, one of the Facebook papers that we read. They had a representation space, which was basically a clip representation space, but they managed to project depth and uh, heat map and audio and a bunch of different things to it. So that's another one you could probably use. Is the I think it was what was it called? It was called like image bind. Yeah, but after we read this paper, it turned out that largely what they did is they kept, they used the clip audio or the clip embedding space, which is text and image, and then they just uh, projected all of these other ones into it, right? So audio, IMU, heat map, and depth. So image bind embedding space is basically clip embedding space. I don't know what clap embedding space is. Maybe it's its own thing, or maybe it's just a variant of the clip embedding space as well provides better quality generations. You experiment with all the above, the T5 encoder, FLAN T5, and CLAP. Okay, so this is the encoders that they're gonna use to encode the text so that they can condition the uh, generation of the audio. So basically, how do you turn the this random sentence of crap here into a little vector, a little embedding, a little representation that you can feed into the model that's doing this uh, codebook prediction? predicting the, the probability distribution over these codebook partitions. While text is the most prominent approach in a conditional generative model, nowadays a more natural approach is conditioning on a melodic structure from another audio track. Right, so hey, can we condition on other audio? So how you can encode that, that's my question. Uh, also follows iterative refinement. To support that, we experiment with controlling with melodic structure via jointly conditioning on the input's chromogram and text description. Is a chromogram just uh, one of those like, yeah, okay, so it's basically like a, there's a, a bunch of different ways to turn audio into images, right? So uh, we've looked at some of these before, but basically, uh, you have here a 2D image and it looks a little weird, but what it's showing you is you have time on the x-axis here. So this is like, uh, whatever, a 10 second long audio. And then these are basically bins and you're basically like, uh, here you can see how there's more low frequency, uh, information in this audio and then kind of less 
high frequency stuff, maybe more noisy high frequency stuff, but it's basically you turn audio into a uh, image. And I think the reason they're going to do that is so that they can condition on it. But that's fucking crazy if they... Yeah, you can't condition on the raw chromogram. Uh, we introduce an information bottleneck by choosing the dominant time frequency bin in each step. So what do they mean by that? So what they mean is that you see here how there's different bins. The y-axis is basically the bins. So rather than conditioning on the full thing, they're going to pick which bin has the most kind of like uh, dominant, aka the reddest, I guess, in this thing. So they're just basically going to limit it to this one of these bins. Uh, while a similar capability, the authors use supervised proprietary data, which is tedious and costly. We take an unsupervised approach. We're eliminating the requirement for supervised data. So, I mean, they have to tokenize, they have to embed, like, uh, create a representation from this chromogram. How the fuck do you condition on the chromogram? Do they even tell you anywhere? Right, like the chromogram is like an image. Like at some point you need to turn that into a vector in order to condition. So how are they turning that into a vector is what I'm asking. Fast Fourier Transform, FFT. Uh, model architecture. Codebook projection and positional embedding. So they have some positional embeddings here. Given a codebook pattern, only some codebooks are present at each pattern step PS. Right, so uh, the codebook patterns, they're these partitions of the set of all basically codebooks. So some in, in an individual codebook pattern, you might have words from some of the alien dictionaries, but some of the other alien dictionaries might not even be inside that codebook pattern. So only some of the codebooks are present. Uh, we retrieve Q from the values corresponding to all to the indices in PS. What was Q again? Q is... The representation Q obtained from the encodec model. So Q is the tokens that come out of the encodec, which goes from raw audio into this these uh, audio tokens. Uh, we retrieve Q from the values corresponding to the indices in PS. Each codebook is present at most once in PS or not at all. Right, so this is consistent with the mathematical definition of, uh, what did they call it, of partitions that we read. If it is present, we use a learn embedding table with n entries and dimension d to represent the associated value from q. So this is the actual code book. Like that's, this is the actual code book here. Uh, otherwise, we use special token indicating its absence. Okay, so this is the null token that they were referring to. We sum the contribution from each codebook after this transformation. The first input is always the sum of all the special tokens. Finally, we sum a sinusoidal embedding to encode the current time step S. Okay, so they're basically taking for a specific pattern, which is some subset of the different alien dictionaries, you are getting some of those, given the queue, you go up and you look up the specific embedding vectors that that codebook is telling you, right? So if we go back to here, right? This E is the index of the code uh, of the index of the words in that codebook, but then the actual little uh, column here represents the actual embedding, and that's really what you want is like. You, you don't want the index of the of the word. You want like the actual definition for that word in the dictionary, right? And the definition is just like this little vector. That's what they're looking up here. Uh, learned embedding table. Here they're calling it embeddings. They sum all of those up, right? So you're going to have however many code books. If you don't have, if that if one of the particular code books doesn't appear in this particular code book pattern, you basically it's like null. Here they're calling it special token. But you add all of those up, and then you also add a sinusoidal embedding, which is the positional embedding, which is basically just a fancy way of 
using sines and cosines to say where along this input sequence am I, right? So rather than uh, giving the current step as a number between 0 and 1, they uh, give it as a positional embedding. Transformer decoder. This is the original transformer paper here, Vaswami et al. And like, I've actually shown this before, but uh, if you actually look at the transformer paper, transformer paper, and then, yeah, you see this little thing here, this positional encoding. You see how that kind of looks like a sine curve? It doesn't really look like a sine curve there, but it looks more like a sine curve than the original one. Yeah, you see how this looks like a little sine? That's positional encoding right there. It's made up of sines and cosines. Um, sinusoidal embedding. The input is fed into a transformer with L layers and dimension D. So uh, dimension D is probably the number of heads, how many, how many deep it is, and then L layers is the number of those blocks that are on top of each other. Each layer consists of a causal self-attention block. So I think we had uh, self-attention versus All right, but self-attention is basically the sequence with itself paying attention to itself. So if we look at an attention map, self-attention. This is kind of, mm, these don't necessarily look good. I want, yeah, something like this. This is self-attention right here. Mary tried to, John to go abroad. Mary tried John to go abroad. So every single element of the sequence can pay attention to itself, right? Every other element of the sequence. So this is your kind of standard self-attention here. Uh, we then use cross-attention block. So cross-attention block, now think of this picture, but it's no longer Mary tried John to go abroad, Mary tried John to go abroad. Now you're gonna have two different things here. You're gonna have potentially the one code book and potentially the other code book. Let's see what they actually are doing. Fed with the conditioning signal C. C is the conditioning signal that's coming from here which is basically the combination of the text conditioning and this melody conditioning based on the chromogram. When using melody conditioning, we instead provide the conditioning tensor C as a prefix to the transformer input. Dude, what? Conditioning tensor, so the chromogram, and not just the chromogram, but the chromogram that has been filtered based on a specific time frequency bin. Okay, so this might this might actually this makes more sense. So a chromogram is a 2D, right? There's a there's a for each frequency bin, right? For each frequency bin, you have a sequence of of kind of like numbers here, right? And because they're limiting it to a specific frequency bin, what they're basically doing is that they're turning a two-dimensional chromogram into a one-dimensional sequence that is limited to a specific frequency bin. So that's that's why they can just uh, add it to the input here. Prefix means they're just basically concatenating it to the front. The layer ends with a fully connected block consisting of a linear layer, fully connected block. This is the here so the linear here fully connected little linear mlp right there consisting of a linear layer from d to four times d channel a relu and then a linear layer back to d channels so this is just a little a little neural net at the very top of their transformer blocks which is pretty common that most uh, transformers do that they have the actual attention here you have self attention here you have cross attention and then usually they have a uh, kind of a standard feed forward here. But here their feed forward basically goes D, then a little bit wider, and then back to D. The attention and fully connected blocks are wrapped with a residual skip connection, also fairly common here. So these are skip connections. You see how you have uh, the, here you have cross attention uh, add a norm is uh, layer normalization. 
but usually uh, this is actually put in the front now. So your cross attention feeds into this feed forward and then you have, you see this little line here, this is the residual uh, connection which allows a little, a path for the signal to travel around that fully connected uh, layer. All right, they're sometimes called residual connections, skip connections. And then layer normalization is applied to each block before being summed. Yeah, and this is uh, something that if you ever watch a Carpathy explainer on Transformers, he constantly mentions this, so I constantly mention it, but apparently in the original Transformer paper, they used to basically put the uh, normalization after the attention blocks and after this feed forward, but since then it's actually moved and in modern transformers it's before the attention and before this feed forward which is what they're saying here it's applied before being summed aka pre-norm uh, log its prediction so the output from the transformer decoder at pattern step s is transformed into a log its prediction for the values of q taken at the indices given by p s plus one okay so remember how what your transformer is doing here is much like in a language model, right, where it predicts the next word, but it's not predicting the next word exactly. What it's giving you is a probability distribution over all possible words. It's telling you here's the probability that the next word is this word, or the next word is this word, or the next word is this word, right? And then you pick which one you want, right? And you can be greedy and just pick the one that highest has the highest value, or you can maybe pick the top five or something like that. There's there's different ways that you can pick from that probability distribution, which is ultimately what the transformer is giving you, right? And those are sometimes called logits. So in a classification model, uh, right, the very last layer, which actually predicts the, the probability distribution Right, let's say you're doing dog cat classification. The very last layer is going to have two things, right? Dog and cat. The raw values of these are called logits. And then generally those logits are fed into a softmax, which is a uh, this, right? So why are they fed into a softmax, right? So here you go logits and then softmax. They're fed into a softmax because the logits look like this, right? The logits look like 5, 2.5, 0.5. But what you want is you want a probability for each word, right? So you want to turn these numbers, which are kind of hard to interpret, right, into a number between 0 and 1. And then that's how you actually get these probabilities here, which are uh, generally what are given to you as confidences. So if you see like a bounding box and it has like a little 0 0.9 confidence in it, that's what that means. It means that the logit of the classification model goes through the softmax and gives you 0.9. So in this case, right, they're not just outputting the probability distribution over all that all possible words in that alien dictionary. They're outputting the probability distribution that is limited by this pattern, right? This this kind of subset of all the words, right? This partition, this like fancy weird partition crap that they're doing here. So the outputs from the decoder, transformer decoder pattern at step PS is transformed into logit predictions, right? So probabilities, aka, for the values of Q. So Q are the actual uh, tokens, the actual alien, the actual words in the alien dictionaries. The values are going to be the description, which is in this case going to be just a vector, an embedding vector, taken at the indices given by PS plus one. So the p this this uh uh this partition p all basically the whole point of that is to is to seemingly limit the uh code book into a smaller set that's that's kind of what i'm guessing is like the whole point of this fucking pattern subset partition crap is so that the logit predictions for the values of Q is way less. It's way less number. It's way less numbers. The dimensionality of that is smaller because this partition is going to be smaller than the full size of the codebook. Each codebook is present at most once in PS plus one. So this uh, codebook pattern, aka is a mashed, it's like, it's 
subsets of all codebooks in one thing. If codebook is present, the login prediction is applied by applying a codebook specific linear layer from D channels to N. Ooh, there's a specific codebook layer. Okay, so let's go back to the transformer. Transformer, why don't I have a picture of the transformer? I should always have a picture of the transformer pulled up, but basically here, you see how they say linear and you see here how they have softmax. So because here you have multiple uh, code books, you're gonna have a code book or you're gonna have a linear layer for each code book. So for each alien dictionary, you have each alien dictionary has 10,000 words. You're gonna have a 10,000 dimensional vector that represents the probability distribution for every word in that alien dictionary. And if you have four alien dictionaries, you're gonna have four of these uh, log it. Dude, I don't know. I feel like I think I understand this, but I don't know if I actually understand this. So if you guys feel like I'm, I'm, I'm intuiting this incorrectly, feel free to, to chime up and give feedback here. Cause you know, I'm just, I'm just a dude. I'm just, I'm just telling you guys what I think, but it could be the case that it's not actually the way it's actually working. Experimental setup. Audio tokenization model. We use a non-causal five layers encodec model for 32 kilohertz monophonic audio. So single channel, I think that's what monophonic means, right? Generally, so not only is audio uh, super high resolution and annoying to deal with, but a lot of times it actually comes in a stereo, which means you have a left and a right, which means that for every second of audio, you don't just have 32,000 uh, samples, you have two times 32,000 samples for left and right. So I think monophonic means that it's just one channel, which means that you only have 32,000 numbers. Uh, stride of 640, this is uh, whenever you create, uh, for example, these uh, spectrogram things, generally you're basically convolving. There's some stride involved because you're basically moving this window so that's where the stride comes in. It's basically how many of subsequent samples are you like uh, considering when you're basically uh, using this encodec model. The final frame rate. So remember how they talked about the uh, frame rate of the encodec is less than less than the frame rate of the audio sample. You see this FR less than less than FS. So now we finally get the numbers for those. FR is uh, 50 hertz, which is 50, 50 samples per second. And then uh, FS is 32 kilohertz, so 32,000. So huge reduction there, right? Go from 32,000 numbers to 50 numbers and an initial hidden size of 64, doubling at each of the model's five layers. Okay, so this is the kind of the depth. So even though you only have 50 numbers now instead of 32,000 numbers, these 32,000 numbers were just a single float number, but now you have 50 numbers, which each has a size of 64. Uh, doubling at each of the model's five layers. The embeddings are quantized with RVQ with four quantizers, so four quantization levels. And then the final size of the codebook, right? So how many how many words are there in this alien dictionary is 2048. I'm curious if I can print the chromogram as an editable image and then let the user just mess with it before input. It looks pretty simple. Yeah, I think the way that they describe this, I think there's potential problems here, right? I really don't like this choosing the dominant time frequency bin in each time step. Like, I feel like this is probably introducing like all kinds of weird shit, right? Cause like, let's say you're recording uh, a melody and you're like at a train station and there's this like really low frequency hum in the background because you're at a train station. It might be the case that 
you can't really tell that that low frequency hum is there but whenever you are doing this uh, chromogram conditioning the chromogram conditioning is saying okay well the dominant time frequency bin in, in this time step is this weird low frequency hum that you don't even realize is there and then when you use this to condition and generate audio you're like i don't understand why is it not getting my melody and it's because it's like it's choosing this weird low frequency bin so yeah there's a lot of variables when doing this uh chromogram so like it's not there's not like one way to do it there's like a, a hundred different variables here you have to choose the window the bins themselves even the there's like these uh, mfccs i think they're called uh control t mfcc mel frequency septrum yeah so these are a bunch of hard-coded numbers that some random person came up with at one time that like are supposed to uh represent the human audible uh bins or something like that and these are often used but you have to basically pick okay well what is the uh the window size what is the bins that i'm choosing and like there's all these like magic numbers that you have to pick for the chromogram so like ideally if you're conditioning on something like this you would basically do a hyperparameter sweep over all the different variables that go into something like uh, a chromogram but i don't know if they actually did that they probably didn't because it's just a bunch of extra work uh they do some pre-processing to filter out drums and bass from skimming the code before creating the chroma yeah maybe, maybe it's not as bad as i'm saying you know like i'm not like an audio guy either so like i don't know if it's the case that there's like one kind of super standard way of creating these chromograms and like that super standard way is actually the way to do it every single time i just remember that like the the brief times that i've tried to do this it's like you have to basically come like have those magic numbers and i'm just like i don't know how to pick these fucking magic numbers you know <laughs> So I don't know, it might be the case that it doesn't actually matter and there's really just one standard way to turn idio or image to, uh, or audio to image. Uh, transformer, we train an autoregressive transformer uh, model at different sizes. So they're gonna train a couple different sizes here, 300, 1.5, and then 3.3 bill. We use a memory efficient flash attention. So uh, we have a bunch of papers on this, but one of the big problems with transformers is as they have this kind of memory uh, issue where the memory cost is big because you have these uh, self attentions, right? So let's go to our self attention, right? Think about this. Every single one, if you have this sequence and you multiply it and you do self attention with the sequence itself, every single one of these squares is a number that you have to keep track of in memory. So if you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, this is a stop token. If you have seven if your sequence is of length seven you now have to keep track of seven times seven numbers in this attention so your memory uh requirement for self-attention with a length seven sequence is seven squared right so this squared attention uh problem and there's a bunch of different techniques that people have used and it seems like they're using the flash attention one uh, to improve both speed and memory attention we study the impact of the size of the model. We use a 300 million parameter model for all our ablations. So they do all their ablations on the small model. So take that with a grain of salt. It might be that the ablations don't uh, don't have the same result in the bigger models. We train on 30 second audio crops sampled at random from the full track. We train the model for 1 million steps with Adam W and a batch size of 192 examples. Here are parameters for the atom optimizer, a decoupled weight decay of 0.1. So weight decay is a pretty standard training technique where you basically think about it like whenever I see weight decay in my head, I actually think about the uh, Avengers Endgame uh, mist gif. Like if you get, uh, what is it, uh, disappear. Yeah, like this, like every time I see weight decay, like I basically think of this. It's like 
the weights in your neural net are like constantly getting erased. They're basically, they're basically every single step, you're kind of killing them a little bit. You're like erasing them. And what that leads is that really only the weights that are actually doing things end up staying. So I don't know. That's, that's what I think of in my head when I think of weight decay. I basically think that. Uh, gradient clipping of 1.0. Gradient clipping means that whenever they're pushing gradients into, into the different uh, parameters of the neural net, right? Your gradient tells you how much you need to change that little parameter and you can clip it, which means that you can say, hey, don't ever change the values of these weights by more than some number, right? Uh, we further rely on de-adaptation based automatic step sizes uh, for the 300 million parameter model improves convergence but showed no gain for the bigger models. So I think step sizes here, they're referring to the step size in the Adam W. So any gradient descent is taking steps and the size of that step depends on your optimizer, right? Uh, Adam optimizer uh, GIF. Yeah, so there's a GIF that I show time and time again that's actually super cool. I think it's this one. Yeah, so Here you can see different optimization algorithms and each each one of those steps. So you can see most of these optimizers have some notion of like momentum, so they tend to take steps uh, in the direction of previous steps. So, but you can see how all of them have slightly different behaviors. Some of them take very very small steps. So you see this SGD, which is kind of the most simple form of an optimizer. It basically just takes these little tiny steps that are all the same size, versus something like Adam W is a little bit more complicated and the re and that's why it has these extra parameters here, right? Uh, we use a cosine learning rate schedule with a warm up of 4,000 steps. So the learning rate changes over the course of the training. This is what a learning rate schedule is. Uh, warm up, especially if you have uh, layer norms and batch norms and all kinds of like extra crap like that, you basically run training for 4,000 steps where you don't actually change any of the model weights and then that's called a warm up. So you're, you're training but you're not actually changing the, the model parameters, you're basically just changing all these additional optimizer state parameters. And then you start pushing gradients. Uh, additionally, we use an exponential moving average with a decay of 0 0.99. Uh, Exponential moving average is basically your, you, you see, this actually is more so a case when you're doing these distributed trainings with lots of GPUs that all uh, training at the same time. And then what happens is that each of those GPUs has a slightly different version of the neural net, right, that they've gotten to from training. So then what you do is you basically just average all of those together. Uh, we train 300 monster amounts of GPUs here. Mixed precision. I think the uh, this is quite popular in, in uh, PyTorch now, where basically the entire model is not at uh, the same uh, data type. So some of them are floating point 16, some of them are floating point 32. I guess here they're using uh, 16 and then brain float 16, which is a another 16-bit data type that has, I think, a more, let's see, B float. 16 there's a specific image yeah so uh, floating point 16 has more uh, bits reserved for the exponent which means that it can store numbers that are very big and very small with less precision versus the normal floating point 16 has more bits here in the actual digit rather than the actual uh, rather than the exponent which means it can store digits to a higher it can store numbers to a higher precision but it can it can't store really really big or really really small numbers so bfloat 16 is very popular for uh neural networks because you have these very very small numbers right like 0 0.00000001345 right something like that uh finally for sampling we employ top k sampling so uh what is sampling here right so like I said, when you this what the transformer is outputting is not the next token, it's outputting a probability distribution over all tokens. So you could just pick the token that has the highest logit or the highest basically probability, 
or you can do these different types of sampling approaches where, for example, top K picks the top K of those and then within those does something, right? Uh, text period processing. Propose a text normalization in which stop words are omitted and the remaining text is lemmatized. We denote this method by text normalization. Okay, so I guess they have a bunch of extra weird characters like musical key are often available. Concatenating such annotations to the text description. We explored using word dropout as another text augmentation strategy. So that's kind of cool. So uh, basically dropping out specific words and then you should get to the same point. We use condition merging with a probability of 0.25. We apply a text description dropout with a probability of 0.5. We use a word dropout with a probability of 0.3. Okay, so it sounds like they basically add extra crap to this. So they don't just say a cheerful country song with acoustic guitars. They also have information like in uh, the C key or something like that. I'm not I'm not a music person, so I don't know what C key means. I don't even know that's the correct terminology, but uh, text that describes the key, the tempo, and the instruments. Codebook patterns and conditioning. We used the delay interleaving pattern. This translates 30 seconds into 1,500 autoregressive steps. So this is how many uh, inference steps it takes for 30 seconds of audio. Uh, for text conditioning, we use the T5 text encoder, optionally with the addition of melty conditioning. We also present flaunt T5 and clap and compare the performance. For melody conditioning, we compute the chromograms with a window size of 2 to the 14 and a hope size of 212. So this is the cra this is what I was going on a rant on is like these numbers, like two to the 14, two, like where are those coming from, right? Like those numbers are just magically chosen. Using a large window prevents the model from recovering fine temporal details. We quantize the chromogram by taking the arg max at each step. So this is the, uh, the other thing we were talking about where you're taking the most quote unquote dominant frequency bin, right? But by doing that, you're kind of filtering in a weird way. Where is it? Yeah, you're, you're only taking the most dominant one. So in this, they're literally implementing it as an arg max. So for every single column here, they're arg maxing, and then that's the value that they use. Uh, and then they drop the condition. So sometimes they condition the model on the thing, and sometimes they don't. So it's like drop out on whether or not they actually even condition it. And then guidance scale is... Uh, Whenever you're conditioning on text, sometimes what people do is they condition on the text and then they run the inference again, but without conditioning on anything. So basically conditioning on something and then conditioning on nothing. And then the scale is basically a weight that allows you to say, well, okay, well, how strong is that uh, conditioning? This is common in uh, stable diffusion and image diffusion models is having this guidance parameter. We use 20k hours of licensed music to train music gen. Specifically, we rely on an internal data set. God damn it, Meta. Why? You know, like every time you read these audio papers, I don't think I've ever seen an audio paper where they're like, here's the data set and you can use it yourself. It's like, I feel like every single time it's an internal data set. And on the Shutterstock and Pond 5 music data. Okay, so these are some other... Uh, I didn't know Shutterstock had music. That's kind of cool. Uh, I wonder why they only have melody conditioning for one of the models, not the large model. Sometimes when you see that, it might mean that it just didn't work well. So, like, people will... If there seems like an obvious thing that they should have done and they don't do it, sometimes what happens is they did do it and they just didn't didn't talk about it because it didn't work well. So that's kind of one nefarious explanation. It could also just be that they had a limited budget and they didn't want to do the big model, you know? So it could be that as well. Uh, we compare objective, subjective metrics. We report both mean and then CI-95. I don't know what this is. What is a CI-95 score? CI-95 score? Is that a confidence interval 95? Yeah, okay. 
I thought it might have been some weird like music specific thing. The Moose AI model, this is another, I think we actually read this one as well, is retrained on the same data set. Well, for music LM, we use the public API for human studies. Uh, this is a different one, I guess. We report that the original FAD on music caps for noise to music. Music refers to music gen trained on chromogram and text. We sample the chromograms at random from a held out set. Okay, so I guess they do compare against a bunch of other things. Moose AI, Refusion, Music LM, Noise to Music. And then here are the different uh, versions of music gen. So you have a small model without the melody, a small, a larger model with the melody, and then a the small model with a random melody. This is kind of cool. So they randomly choose chromogram sometimes just to see how much the chromogram is actually doing. Uh, KL, maybe KL divergence or something. I don't know what this is. Clap score, OVL. Lower is better. That's what these arrows mean. Lower is better, lower is better, higher is better, higher is better, higher is better. Generally, when you see these kind of metrics, like I don't know what the fuck uh, OVL really is, right? But one way to, to kind of get past that is just look at the difference between these. So the difference between these ones, you have 76, 80, and 79. And then he here, <clears throat> you have 80, 84, 81. So it's a little bit better, but still kind of within the same area, right? 77, 82, 74 for the things they're comparing against, and then 83, 82, 81. And kind of the weird thing here is that you see how here the music gen without the melody is lower than the music gen with the random melody, and here the music gen without the melody is higher than the music gen without the random melody. So it seems like the melody conditioning is actually not necessarily probably doing anything here. You know, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, and if that's the case, usually that means that it's either not doing anything or it's potentially even hurting. Uh, full-length music, metadata composed of a textual description and additional information such as the genre. Uh, BPM is beats per minute and tags. For the main results and comparison, we evaluate the proposed method on Music Caps benchmark. Music Caps is composed of 5.5k samples prepared by expert musicians in 1k subset balanced across genres. So balanced there refers to the fact that generally when you're doing uh, classification, which is probably what this original data set was designed for. Uh, you don't want a data set that has 90 images of dogs and then 10 images of cats. Ideally, you want a balanced data set, right? 50 images of dogs, 50 images of cats. So I don't know this data set, Music Caps Benchmark, but I assume it was probably created for some kind of uh, classification task, at which point they probably balanced it across those different music genres. We report objective metrics on the unbalanced set while we sample examples from the genre balanced set for qualitative evaluations. We use samples, 528, no artist overlap. Uh, we compare music gen to two baselines for music, text to music, Refusion, Moose AI. We use the open source Refusion model. We train a model using our data set for a fair comparison. Uh, we compared the method using subjective metrics, the Frisché audio distance. Uh, so KL was KL divergence, uh, and then clap score. So KL divergence is going to be uh, a, a, a way to tell if two distributions are similar or dissimilar. It's like a distance metric for div distributions, but it's all it's like kind of weird because it's like non-commutative. Uh, and then Frechet audio distance is kind of like the Frechet inception distance. They're probably just encoding it. Uh, yeah, so they put the audio through a VGG and then they look at the distance between the one audio and the other, right? The final embedding of the VGG, the last layer of that VGG. So I don't like these metrics. I don't like these uh, distance metrics based on very ancient models. There's a one that they use in images all the time too using the inception model and it's just I cringe every time I see it because it just doesn't 
those losses weren't the that embedding space especially the embedding space of inception models or these old vgg models like they're not distance in that space isn't necessarily semantically meaningful i guess is why i don't like it a low fat score indicates the generated audio is plausible uh, we use a state-of-the-art audio classifier trained for classification on audio set to compute the KL divergence over the probabilities of the labels between the original and the generated music. Okay, so they have some audio classification model. That audio classification model is going to output a probability distribution over all the different categories of audio that it was trained on, right, the classes. And they're saying, okay, well, if we feed uh, the audio that we generated and then some other audio that we know is real audio, and we feed both of these into this audio set classification model, the probability distribution over all possible uh, music categories should be similar. And that's where they use the KL divergence. Uh, expected to share similar concepts. But again, I don't. the reason I don't like these type of uh, metrics that are based on models is that how good is this audio set model, right? How good is this VGG model? There's there's weird dynamics inside these models that I don't think, you know what I'm saying? Like there could be just like one tiny weird little hum in the sound that completely throws off this audio model. And this audio model says, okay, well, this is definitely not uh, EDM. This is definitely metal music. And then you get a very high KL divergence because the audio set model is predicting that this is very definitely metal music and very definitely not EDM. But then a human is listening to it and the human can't even hear that weird little like hum and then therefore they would see these two pieces of music as more similar than different so i don't know I'm, i feel like i'm not necessarily explaining it super well but i just don't like whenever people use kind of these uh models to come up with these metrics that are numerical right the fad and this kl that there's a number but the number is misleading. The number makes you think that there's like, you can actually measure that, but I don't think you can actually, that number doesn't have that, that level of precision. Uh, share similar concepts. The clap score is computed between the track, track description and the generated audio, generated audio to quantify audio text alignment. Again, also another metric seemingly based on a specific model. Follow the same setup, ask human raters to evaluate two aspects of the audio sample, overall quality, OVL, and relevance to the text input, REL. Okay, so REL and OVL are the human scores, and then FAD, KL, and CLAP are these uh, uh, model-based scores. So these are really the ones you have to pay attention to, right? This is the humans listening to track A and track B and then telling you which one they like better or which one sounds better or which one's more consistent. So these are more, these are the numbers that matter. These numbers I think are misleading. The human could be an audio engineer to check the sound and use tools to make sure the data set is good. For the overall quality test, raters were asked to rate the perceptual quality in a range of 1 to 100. Amazon Mechanical Turk, everybody's favorite uh, <laughs> weird online task thing. We report cosine similarity between reference and generated audio and generated me melody. Okay, so they feed the melody into some kind of encoder, turn it into a vector, an embedding, and then use cosine similarity. So text versus text plus the melody. So if you train only to condition on text and then you test only on the text, if you train to condition on text and the uh, melody as a chromograph and then only test on text and then if you train on text and the chromograph and then test on 
text in the chromograph. So actually this goes down, right? Higher is better. So you see here how if you train on the text and the melody, but then only use the text to condition, you actually get worse except for here where you get better. So it actually like this whole like melody conditioning actually seems to like hurt it sometimes. Sometimes it works, but sometimes it doesn't. Even these number here, right? It's like, it's like, oh, look at this. We got a high score here with Mel, but this score is about the same as this one. And this one's lower than this one. So this isn't convincing to me. Like, I don't think this melody conditioning is actually good. All samples are normalized at negative 14 decibels. There is audio software that can check for his distortion. Yeah, there's probably, uh, I don't know enough about audio, but I guess there's, there's probably things that, uh, kind of clean the audio sample before you actually use it for anything. They might not even have to do that. I'm sure these data sets uh, that they used, music caps and all of these are probably already pre-cleaned if I had to guess. Uh, we start by presenting the results on the task of text to music audio generation and compare music gen to prior works. We evaluate the ability of the proposed method to generate music condition on melodic features, conclude with an ablation study present the comparison against these ones. There's no official implementation nor pre-trained model. Similarly, is not public. So this is kind of the unfortunate sorry state of um, music stuff, right? A lot of code is not available, models are not available, so they have to kind of re-implement everything. Uh, music gem performs better than the evaluated baselines. Uh, but it's the implementations of the evaluated baselines. And this is a problem too, is that sometimes if you're, when there's no official implementation and you re-implement it yourself, you're doing a quick and dirty implementation. So your implementation is not as good as the original author's implementation. So if you're using your own re-implementation of, of somebody else's stuff and using that as a baseline, that's not necessarily, uh, a faithful reproduction, right? And it could be the case that if the author implemented, if the, if you use the official author implementation of noise to music, it would actually be better, but your shitty implementation of it is worse than yours. So yeah, you get into all kinds of issues when you have to evaluate or you have to make your own implementations of things for baselines, which is the problem with not having a, uh, reproducible research, right? Like all this secrecy and machine learning leads to having to re-implement things in order to do these baselines, but then having to re-implement things means you're not actually comparing to the actual thing. You're comparing to a weird version of the actual thing that you created. So I don't know, release the model and the code, even if it's just for the sake of, of being able to evaluate stuff. Yeah, adding melody conditioning degrades the objective metrics, which is kind of what we were seeing from these tables. However, it does not significantly affect human ratings. We introduce a new metric, chroma cosine similarity, which measures the average cosine similarity between frames corresponding to the same time steps taken from the quantized chroma of the reference and the generated samples. Okay, so they take the chromograph of the reference in the samples and then specific frames of those and then cosine similarity between those two. Is that like an accurate way to, like is that even gonna give you anything? Present ra uh, raters with the reference music piece followed by a set of generated pieces for each generated sample. The listeners are asked to rate how well the melody of the generated pieces matches the reference on a scale of one to 100. Results suggest that music gen trained with chromogram conditioning successfully generates music that follows a given melody. 
thus allowing for general better control. Codebook patterns. We compare different codebook interleaving patterns on 30 second audio sequences. The flattening pattern achieves the best scores. The delay and partial flattening patterns achieve similar scores. So this is whenever they do that offset and then flattening is when they just basically concatenate it with all of the uh, quantization levels. Number of steps. So you can see here how the delay pattern results in the least amount of steps, which is kind of telling you why they did this delay pattern versus flattening has almost like six times as many steps. I'm not even going to look at these numbers. I'm going to look at these ones here and <laughs> kind of seems like it doesn't matter at all. All these numbers are basically the same. 76, 79, 88, 79, 79, 79. Yeah, it's kind of a wash to me. I don't think any of this matters. These numbers are all the same. We compare three scales for our method evaluated using an internal test. Okay, so here are the three different sizes of the models. And again, we see kind of a similar result where the human raters over here are just, they don't really seem to care. Like all of these kind of seem roughly the same quality, which is interesting because it means that the 3.3 billion parameter model really isn't that much better than the 300 million parameter model. It's better on these metrics, but these metrics are the kind of model-based metrics, which are, and even then it's not even that much better, right? You're talking about 0 0.35, 0 0.36, 0 0.96, 0 0.82. So the humans don't seem to be able to notice the difference and then even the model based metrics are barely noticing a difference so 300 million parameters is seemingly all you need uh, this section provides an ablation study for different code patterns uh, and a text encoders all ablations are performed using 1k samples of 30 seconds randomly sampled from the held out evaluation set we evaluate various codebook patterns using the framework with k equals 4, so 4 codebooks, uh, which represent 4 levels of residual vector quantization. Table 1 reports results with a delay pattern, partial delay, consists in delaying the same amount in codebooks 2, 3, and 4. Parallel pattern predicts all codebooks from the same time step in parallel. And then valley pattern first predicts codebook 1 for all steps, then predicts the pair in parallel codebooks 2, 3, and 4. This sentence right here is literally what they should have put at the beginning here. Like, I feel like this two, like these three, four sentence here is basically makes so much more sense than all this crap that they were putting here. Like they could have gotten rid of this entire section here where they just introduce all this unnecessary mathematical notation and just literally said it like this. Partial delay is where you delay the same amount for codebooks 2, 3, and 4, right? You have four codebooks, and the first codebook is the one that has the most signal, so that makes sense. Parallel patterns means you do all of them at the same time, but now because you're doing all of them at the same time, you're not capturing that kind of the, the dependence that they have, right? So you're potentially missing out on something there. And then the valley pattern seems to be like this basically combination where you basically do the first one and then you do in parallel two, three, and four. Thus, this pattern has twice the number of steps. Partial flattening is similar, but instead of sampling the first codebook one for all steps, it interleaves them with the parallel sampling of two, three, and four. Finally, the flattening pattern consists of flattening all the codebooks. We report objective and subjective. While flattening improves generation, it comes at a high computational cost and similar performance can be reached for a fraction of the cost, yeah. So that's what we saw here, right? It takes 6,000 steps versus 1,500 steps. And if the quality is gonna be largely the same, you might as well just do the thing that's faster. In table four, we report results for different model sizes. Scaling the model size results in better scores but barely so, so yeah. Uh, we 
related work. This is kind of sometimes cool. Like I feel like more and more people put the related work section at the end. You know, like they want people to read and sometimes if you put the related work section right after the introduction, it can get, it can kind of like people just stop reading, right? They read the introduction. The related work is usually kind of one of the most boring sections in a paper because you're just sitting there like referring to 50 other papers. Nobody wants to read that. So I'm kind of seeing this pattern more and more again and I agree with it. This kind of like put the related work right before the conclusion. Just, it's basically just like a glorified reference section. You know what I'm saying? Like all you're really doing is you're just like, mentioning like 50 other papers so yeah why not get rid of it put it in the end you know put it in the appendix so you don't need this crap uh related to recent advancements in recent years the prominent approach is to represent the music symbols in a compressed representation right they're using the encodec tokens and then apply the generative model on top of it so same way that you do image generation and you do the diffusion in the latent space here you do the generation in the token space of this encodec model uh, recently proposed to apply vqvae on the raw waveform using residual vector quantization uh, several research studies use this representation for text to audio music generation has been long studied 2018 paper <laughs> like a long studied means 2018 like that's the level of machine learning uh research speed as that's a 2018 paper is considered ancient okay, so people have been doing gan based music generation symbolic music generation so i think one of you guys was talking about uh midi files i think symbolic music generation is midi files uh, proposed an unsupervised segmentation for symbolic music, which can then be used for generation. Modeling polyphonic music. I don't know what polyphonic music is. Maybe multiple instruments or something. Uh, proposed representing music in multiple streams of discrete representations. Uh, two sparse transformers. So this is the kind of uh, hierarchical uh, kind of approach. Uh, representing music using multiple streams of semantic and acoustic tokens. I think this is another pattern that we've seen before. Uh, and I think this is more for, I've seen this for, or we saw this for speech, right? So you have tokens that represent the meaning or the semantic meaning of the, spe of the speech, like the, the what you're actually saying, and then acoustic tokens for the actual sounds that you're producing, the phonemes. So like separating out the sound from the meaning that we've definitely seen that before. Uh, they applied a cascade of transformer decoders conditioned on a textual music joint representation. Followed a similar approach. An alternative approach is using diffusion models. Diffusion, which we naturally apply over continuous representations. So in diffusion, you're basically adding and removing noise, which means that the latent representation needs to be continuous, right? So if you're doing latent diffusion, the uh, latent representation is continuous, but here they're doing it with code books, so they can't do diffusion. Uh, proposed a cascade of diffusion models that gradually increase the sampling rate. Other people just literally straight up tuned stable diffusion to generate spectrograms. I think this was cool work where somebody literally, the way that they generate audio is by uh, training a fine tuning, a image generation model to generate these, these fucking spectrograms and then just use that. And the fact, the fact that that works is pretty fucking crazy. Like the fact that there's enough examples of spectrograms in stable diffusion or like the the primitives within these diffusion models are good enough that they can basically be transfer uh trans use transfer learning or fine tuning to get it to work for these spectrograms uh several studies were proposed for text to audio environmental sounds generating representing audio spectrograms using vqvae and then applying a discrete diffusion model conditioned on textual t clip embedding. So another kind of example of doing the generation in this kind of image space. Transformer language model over discrete audio followed by quantizing directly time domain signals. Propose using latent diffusion models with a task while extending it to various tasks. Okay, so people have tried every single weird combination of all the different bags of tricks that we have 
to generate audio. And it seems to me like there's still a lot of, there isn't like a, a agreed upon kind of way of doing this. It still seems like people are exploring the, the system space, I guess, for audio generation, where it seems like there's not, there's not one standard way of doing it. There's like a billion different little tricks that all these people are using. But it might just be because I'm not a music person, so I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I'm kind of digging myself into a hole. Let me take another sip. We introduced Music Gen. A state-of-the-art single-stage controllable music generation model that can be conditioned on text and melody. We demonstrate a simple codebook interleaving strategies can be used to achieve high quality generation while reducing the number of autoregressive time steps compared to the flattening approach. Furthermore, we com provided a comprehensive study of the impact of model sizes, conditioning methods, and text pre-processing techniques. We also introduced a simple chromogram-based conditioning for controlling the melody of the generated audio. Our simple generation method does not allow us to have fine-grained control over adherence to the generation. We rely mostly on CF guidance. While it is relatively straightforward to do data augmentation, conditioning on audio warrants further research. Large-scale generative models present ethical challenges. An agreement with Shutterstock. This is kind of low-key. You have meta-AI researchers mentioning that they have an agreement with Shutterstock? Is that even public? Did they pay for this? Shutterstock expands long-standing relationship with Meta? Huh. which follows our partnerships with OpenAI and LG AI Research. So everybody's using Shutterstock. OpenAI, LG, which is the, uh, they make like fridges and TVs and shit like that. Interesting. A second aspect is the potential lack of diversity in the data set we use, which contains a larger proportion of Western style music. Generative models can represent an unfair competition for artists. Think about the artists. It's open research can ensure that all actors have equal access to these models. Agreed. Authors would like to thank multiple people. Cool, let's see if there's anything in these uh, appendices here. Partial flattening pattern. Of visualizing the partial flattening and partial delays codebook patterns applied on a sequence of four parallel streams of quantized values. So here you have the different residual codebooks. So k equals one is going to be kind of the more important one, and then these are uh, codebooks of quantized residuals. So this k equals four one is honestly the most meaningless one. Here you have the sequence itself. So this is the sequence that the transformer is trying to generate the next token of. Partial delay pattern. So here you only predict the first one and then you predict this like shift. So basically the, the ones that matter less, two through four, are shifted by one. This is kind of like this alternating where you're predicting the first one, then the next three, then the second one, then the next three, then this one's going to be way faster. You see how much more compressed it is? Partial flattening interleaves them with a parallel sampling, leading the number of interleave sequence steps to be twice the original number of steps n. Yeah, so the problem here is that every single one of these steps is compute, right? So think of, here you have twice as many steps of compute, s to the 2n versus s to the n. Interesting. 
In this work, we provide unsupervised approach for melody conditioning. Here's the actual uh, text encoder that they used, T5. Two hundred twenty million parameters. What a weird set of languages: <laughs> English, French, Romanian, and German. Like, what, what the fuck is Romanian coming from, right? Uh, different text encoders. These shouldn't necessarily matter, <laughs> but they do. Look at this. <laughs> The difference between T5 and Flan T5 is 84 versus 86 versus 79. Compare that to the uh, difference here. Of the uh, codebook pattern. 79, 79, 72, 74. Or the difference here in the model size. 78, 81, 79. Like there's almost more, uh, wh choosing which text encoder to use seems to be just as important, if not more important, than all the other extra crap that they were doing. Which is kind of crazy to think about, right? And this is something that we saw in other models too, where any, all these other models that use basically, uh, are conditioning on text you see this uh, time and time again where the text encoder and using the largest and best possible text encoder is one of the most important things you could do which is kind of crazy all right so here they're changing the Text augmentation, which is where they drop out specific words in the sentence, random words in the sentence, add more crap to the sentence. De-adaptation. De-adaptation is a novel automated way of selecting the overall learning rate of the Atom Optimizer by basically picking this alpha dynamically throughout the training. Visualization of quantized chromogram bins. So if you remember, they were doing the argmax, right? So they only pick one of the bins, and then this shows you the bin that they're picking over the sequence of time. So only the yellow part is being given to the model to condition. The blue part is all ignored. Oh... Uh... Okay, so this whole time I thought, okay, they're conditioning on a melody. I'm thinking in my head someone's like humming a melody into a microphone. But if you're using a MIDI file for the melody and that MIDI file produces very clear, distinct tones, the chromogram of that MIDI file sound is going to have a very clear uh bin that kind of has everything and then the rest is basically just empty so the cleaner the melody is that you're using to condition the less important the fact that they did the argmax of these bins is hmm. so that's actually a good point there uh, here you have perplexity perplexity is usually used to measure uh, generation for language models. I don't know what perplexity in the space of audio tokens. But here they're just showing you that D atom versus atom. D atom seems to be a little bit better, I guess. No, it's actually worse. Worse conversion. You probably could, yeah. That almost seems like uh, that's a very good idea, Jonathan, right? Like rather than uh, in this example here, they like, this is like a upload an audio MP3 file, but like instead of that, yeah, just literally provide a 10 by 10 grid where you can click and create like, I think there's like plenty of like 
kind of like the uh, Fruity Loops music production, FL Studio. Yeah, like basically provide this interface, the like MIDI, the MIDI interface that you see in a lot of music generation uh, uh, software, right? Like give me this interface here where I can click, 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 and then use that instead of this shit that you're doing here where you, you drag an MP3 file, you convert that into a uh, chromograph, then you filter that chromograph to the argmax, turn that into, like, just, I think that's a very good idea, Jonathan. You just basically put this instead in there. Mm -hmm. Cool, so that's the end of it, guys. We got to it, page 15. All right, let's see, can we do a summary? Let's take a quick break, let's think about it. Let's take a little sip of this yerba mate here. All right, so today we read Simple and Controllable Music Generation, a paper out of Meta AI. They uh, are largely, what they did is they trained a generative music model that can be conditioned on text, which is encoded with a T5 text encoder, or it can be also conditioned on a melody. The melody is uh, another waveform, and what they do is they uh, turn it into an image, other, otherwise known as a chromogram, and then they apply some aggressive uh, argmax and filtering to that chromogram to get something that you can actually condition this generative model on. So the generative model is not generating an actual audio waveform. What it's generating is tokens from a uh, VQVAE called uh, encoder, encodec, where is it? All right, I don't know what the encoder, but there's an encoder and a decoder that goes from raw audio into tokens and then tokens into raw audio. So all the generative stuff is happening in that token space and that latent space. So that latent space is quantized with residual vector quantization. And that residual vector quantization, there's four levels of quantization, right? And each of those levels of quantization has a code book, which is these K1 to K4 here. So Normally, you would have to basically do this, this flattening pattern where to get, uh, you would predict first the first residual vector quantization on the first code book, and then you would have to use that to feed it to the next one, and then feed the next one, and then feed the next one, because, because this second one depends on the first one, right, because of just the way that you're quantizing this, you kind of want to be able to, you kind of want to do this. But the problem with this is that then you're, you have to basically do inference four times in order to get the full signal, right? So you could do it in parallel, which is what they're showing you here, but then you're missing out on the fact that this one here should really kind of be conditioned on this one because this is the quantized residual of this, right? So this is what you would do. Uh, ideally, this is what you would do if you didn't give a shit and you just wanted to be as fast as possible. So they found this kind of like middle ground in between where they basically are doing these like kind of like delays, these shifts, where they basically shift the top three code books here because these code books here matter less than this first code book. This first code book is the most important. So there's a couple different patterns that they have. They're calling these patterns, code book patterns, but basically it's just different ways of doing an autoregressive uh, modeling. Uh, and it's just all about saving time, right? It's all about this trade-off between quality and performance. Uh, what else? They have this very long section here where they kind of like try to be excessively mathematically formal and define these patterns but I found this to actually be more confusing than actually uh, helping, and I actually thought that there was a sentence at the very end here where they describe it that makes so much more sense. Yeah, right here in the ablation study here where they talk about the different patterns, I think this is literally the best 
summary of the different weird patterns and why they did them. Uh, they compare their generated music, which they train on an internal secret data set. So we don't actually know what data set they train this on, but they have a couple different metrics that are based on uh, distances in some model embedding space or the difference between a distribution from a audio classification model, which is this KL. But then they also uh, evaluate with human evaluators. Uh, based on the human evaluations, to be honest, it doesn't actually look like this paper achieves much like it, the the results are kind of on par with the other models that they imp, that they compared to and they did compare to a bunch of other models uh, such as refusion musei and so on so it seems like we're kind of getting to this like soft limit in terms of audio quality uh, uh, as subjectively evaluated by humans it seems like humans they're really not being we're not really able to tell apart these different models they're all kind of the same at least that's what this the story of this subjective evaluation is telling me is that right it's not like these are 90 and then the previous ones are 50 like all of these are kind of the same so yeah that's that's basically the paper is just a kind of a cool interesting little paper where they basically do this uh i think that the biggest most novel contribution here is this these weird uh patterns that are all about kind of doing things faster without losing uh, quality. And they release their model. So you can go on GitHub, look at the code. They say they released the model, right? They say and models, but let's actually see. If we go here, go to the 300 million parameter model. I would use the, so based on the tables, it seemed like the 300 million parameter model was actually just as good as the 3.3. The 3.3 is barely better, so I would actually just use the 300 million if you're interested in using this. But if you go here, they do have it. You go to the files, they do seem to have a model here. So maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. Uh, it sounds a lot better in my personal opinion. Yeah, I mean, also like the, the subjective studies, they're using uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk and like, <laughs> Let's just say that the quality of people on Amazon Mechanical Turk isn't necessarily super high. Like it's probably just like some random ass dude in the Philippines who's like sitting there at like an internet cafe, you know, with a pair of flip flops. And like, so he's listening to audio. Like, I don't know. I don't know if the subjective metrics here are necessarily indicative. I'm sure if you had a bunch of Hans Zimmer, like super hardcore audio engineers they would be able to get you much better subjective metrics um but yeah that's that's basically it thanks m9 they call mechan jonathan fly all you guys who made comments trust me bro thanks for hanging out thanks for joining thanks for uh listening and see you guys tomorrow we'll be doing a little bit of uh code a little bit code and hangout Maybe we work on the Discord bot. Maybe we try to do something else. But if not, have a great Tuesday and see you guys later.